So, um, hello, bonjour à tous. Um, my name is Kathleen de Roo. I'm a technical writer and information uh, architect at Pronovix. And what I do is exploring developer portal content. I love diving into its architecture, figuring out which features make the overall experience better. So um, Pronovix is a company that is specialized in building developer portals, and we do the whole package. We do the architecture, design, um, content creation, development, and research as well. And first of all, thank you for being here, sharing knowledge so that I can learn, but also thank you to my colleagues who uh, are awesome to work with. And um, I'd also like to point out that this presentation is the result of the work done by many people uh, doing a lot of research, so a thank you for those, um, to those for providing food for thought. So, first of all, we look into what, what we at Pronovix think that developer portals are and what developers expect and need of a developer portal and of its APIs. Then we'll move into um, um, architecting developer experience and how you can do that by reducing the API friction. And we'll also look into how you can engage your users. And in the last chapter, uh, we'll, go into some, we'll look into some case studies from the banking and fintech industry. So, in fact, I think it all comes down to this, inspire your users, motivate them to, to work with your product, both intrinsically because they enjoy the working with your product because of the task itself, but also extrinsically because they get rewarded um, for doing that, that job, for example, because they get paid. So, um, so how can you expire, uh, inspire those developers on public-facing developer portals? Because that is what I will concentrate on today. Um, while explaining, I'll, I will use a, quite a lot of examples taken from public-facing developer portals that stand out nowadays or that have great features. But if you know of a great example that you can't see featured here in this talk, then please come, come to me afterwards. I would love to hear about that. So, what is a developer portal? Developer portal is a place where you can park your APIs, where stakeholders, your users can use them, and where your business goals get translated into your API strategy. And for that, it has different tasks. First of all, um, developer portals are a communication nexus for all API stakeholders. And with stakeholders, we do not only have the developers. Of course, developers are the main audience. So we have the developers that use the API. We have the developers that create the API. We have the product owners. We have the technical writers, help and support team, marketing people, salespeople. And of course, the, con the consumers that use the service that embeds the API. So, first of all, one of the most important tasks is that developer portals are a self-service support hub. Because you can't onboard each single user, that would cost an enormous amount of time and money. So you have to make sure that your users can figure out things themselves. For example, um, you can make it easy to set up an account. For example, you can only ask for a few fields. For first, uh, in the first phase, and have a process to make sure that people can easily get what, how the onboarding process looks like. Developer portals are also trust signals because they need to generate trust. Because you, as a user, you, you will want to know if you can use the developer portal and its APIs over a long period of time. So it is important to plant trust elements all over the portal in different content categories. And you can do this, for example, via, via legal documentation, where you set the boundaries for API usage. Um, you can have, for example, um, links that link to uh, content below, because these, uh, not everyone is, uh, is an expert in legal documentation. So if you have um, clear descriptions that can help, you can have other quick links. And of course, um, if, if you mention the date of latest changes, that can also help to generate trust. Also, of course, in the financial industry, it's important to have maximum data security. So data security information is also a trust signal. If you put that on your landing page directly, then you generate trust again. Pricing information, where you um, list pricing models or you list business models, you give pricing information on the business models, that is also a trust signal. So that users will have to know what to pay for which model, what do they get in return. If something is for free or you ask for money, let users know until what point it is, it costs that amount of money or it is for free. 
and what they get in return. Dev portals are also a documentation database for all of the stakeholders, so it's not only about API references, as I will show later on. So, how can you architect DX? What is developer experience? That is what comes in here. Well, you can consider the developer portal as a tool to acquire, convert, and retain users. So make users come to your portal, make them stay there, and make them return. How can you do that? You can do that by engaging them, and that is where DX comes in. DX is all about motivating and engaging your users, but it's also about achieving things and not experiencing friction. Because developer experience is the inverse of API friction. And if you have API friction, that will destroy your API value. So how can you reduce that friction and engage and motivate your users? Well, it is hard because, of course, your users are different. Even within that group of developers that use the API, there are huge differences. For example, you can have beginner users, you can have advanced users, and also users that prefer specific programming languages. But Developers can also have different needs and goals. You have, can have, especially with public-facing developer ports, you can have hobby users, you can have professional users, you can have code-oriented learners, you can have uh, concept-oriented learners. So, how can you address those? The thing is that developer portal needs to enable user journeys for all of these specific users. User journeys are the moments between meeting something for the first time and reaching an end goal. So your users will have different needs and expectations going on a journey. And how can we address those needs? Well, by addressing the user journeys, the user journey steps, to be more precise. And the downstream developer journey is the user journey of the developer that uses your API. And we think there are six stages, we call them like this, but others might call them slightly differently, but it all comes down to the same thing. So in the first phase, you would want to discover and research what the API is about, then evaluate it, get started, develop and troubleshoot, celebrate it because you have done a good job, and then maintain it over a long period of time. So if your developer portal provides entry points for all of those stages, separately, your users will be able to find all your kinds of users, will be able to find what they need, and the experience with your site will be better. So, let's look into some examples. The, um, I have 23 developer portals in this talk from the banking and fintech industry, and the banking industry, which was a closed world for a long period of time, got shaken up by fintech competitors and by PSD2. So it is interesting to see how they did react and how, what, what examples they have on, on their portals. So we'll look into the examples by having the user journey steps as our guideline. So first of all, it's about discovering and researching. So what, how can the portal help you to uh, solve a specific task? And a landing page is very important, an overview page is very important in this step, but of course it can also address the other steps, because a landing page, of course, does not only um, address developers, but also can also address the other stakeholders. Ideally, they help to show you the site architecture to navigate the content, and they can re uh, direct and redirect users if necessary. And a landing page best answers the following questions. Uh, what is the API about? How does it work? Uh, where can I find resources? Can I trust it? And how can I start integrating? And the how can I start integrating, for example, has been uh, mentioned three times because the getting started is for uh, concept-oriented learners, sample code-oriented code learners, and the references, of course, for more experienced users. So this is an example of how you can answer those questions. Um, in the financial industry, we, you can, you can uh, for example, do it this way, that if you want to show how the API is, uh, API is working, you can have a visual on the API architecture on your landing page. It is also important to decide who you, you want to reach out to. In other words, who are your primary personas? And then you can give 
those users entry points to start their single journeys. And this influences, of course, the scope of your landing page. For example, you can focus on APIs for developers, you can focus on trust signals for decision makers, or you can focus on code, again, more developer focused. You can also have um, other entry points like a uh, call to action to start building directly or uh, have a call to action to find more part, uh, information on partner models. Another example here for developers, sandbox and production and articles for business users. You can also choose to have use cases on your uh, landing page because use cases can reflect the tasks that you need to finish with the APIs. So that can make selecting what you need to finish a task easier. Of course, um, it is important to make sure that um, your users can browse through the solutions and the features you provide and an API catalog can help in that. You can uh, provide fil a filtering system, you can have tags on versioning and say whether the, the API is PD, PSD2 compliant or not yet. Um, you can have descriptions as well. Another example with a more complex filtering, filtered search, and then of course you can have direct links to the documentation as well. So in this stage, landing pages and API catalogs are important. So landing pages with a scope that reflect, reflect the needs of your primary personas and API catalogs that show features and solutions well. In the second stage, it's all about whether you can trust the organization's commitment. And here, use cases can be important again, and they can go from a general description where you are saying who it is for into more details where finally you get to the documentation. You can also have a blog, and a blog is easy to evaluate whether um, people work regularly on, on the site. So it, and it can be somewhere between a sales tool and, develop, and developer documentation, which of course depends on the focus of your blog. But if you don't have people to write, then an empty blog can be worse than, than having no blog. Of course, tryout options are very important uh, to evaluate the API. You can have a playground, provide an option to run the code in Postman. And sandboxes are very popular, especially amongst banks, because you don't have to reveal personal data and you can still test the API. Also, trust signals are change logs, API status pages, API, uh, change logs that indicate reliability, availability of the API, and if you give them a dedicated place on your landing page, that can also help users to evaluate what, what, your, what your API and developer portal stand for. Also, make it clear and easy to find out whether an API is suitable for the user or not, and communicate that well, so that can also reduce the friction. So in this stage, blog, use cases, tryout and test option and trust signals were important. Then let's get to the getting started phase. So here, people will want to know where to begin and what can you do with that to reduce the friction. Self-service, as Adam mentioned before, is very important. Make, make it easy for people to get started. For example, give them an outline of how to do that. For example, you can have a checklist on your landing page. You can also have a, a clear overview of all the steps needed and add visuals next to that that change with each step. You can also make processes understandable. I've mentioned these visuals before. And of course, tutorials and step-by-step -step guides. Tutorials fo follow the read to learn to do principle. So um, they are typical documentation that explains how to get started. You can have an overview of tutorials via links. Um, on the right, you have the steps with a link. So if you have done step one um, yesterday and want to get to step two, you don't need to scroll. You just click on the link. And of course, they don't forget about the non-developers either, which can also be important. Also, explaining how to obtain API keys and tokens in an easy to understand way is important. So you can add screenshots um, or have like a, a detailed explanation to make sure that people know how to do these things. 
Software development kits, SDKs, can provide everything to get started, especially when they focus on mo multiple programming languages. They can be a great help to get started and, um, and to onboard your users. They are not needed, but they can be a great help. Also, explaining uh, domain-related language is important, but f because, for example, the word Dunning can be important in the financial industry. It's not in my everyday dictionary, but if you want people to, to know uh, what you are talking about, then you can, for example, add a video tutorial, or you can have a hover-over function where, where you get the explanation when you scroll over the word. So here, the onboarding process, the onboarding doc, self-service support elements were important. Then, let's get to the, the more detailed code. Uh, API references, yeah, they come in many forms. You can have one, two, three columns, collapsible columns, but the, it is important to have, for example, a language, programming language selector to have examples. You can also include error dictionaries that actually explain what the error means. You can have versioning information, comments, descriptions, etc. Um, make code handling easy. You can have a copy-paste button. You can also have highlighted code. Also, something that we found was uh, having best practices on integrations to uh, recommend integration options. But of course, if in case something goes wrong, users would want to find support options. And FAQs are very popular, but to avoid having an endless list of questions, you can arrange those um, FAQs. So how can you do that? You can have, for example, categories, and when you click on a specific category, you get the questions that go with that category. Or you can have audience-focused FAQs to help your users, those specific users, to orient their knowledge. So this is a more uh, general FAQ page, and then you can have also a more technical one. Contact forms can take different focuses. For example, you can have um, a place where you ask the, your users to to, to um, select their issue and then have links to the documentation that would explain that issue. You can also ask them to, s to submit something, like add screenshot, for example. And you get bonus points if you, points if you mention the time that is needed to get an answer. That will also reduce the friction. <laughs> Support options in one place is a good idea because you can collect all options so that users can cho choose from the, the options that fit their needs best. Um, what they are used to using, for example, here is Slack, Trello, GitHub. You can also have a community page mentioned on that support overview page. Other examples are where you have a search bar, you can explore the topics, and where you have options for a specific um, for a specific re uh, the customers of a specific region. You can also have for, for, um, or forum community pages for peer-to-peer -peer support because peer-to-peer um, -peer support is about developers solving problems amongst themselves and if, in case that is done well, you can even include the solutions into your basic docu um, documentation later on. But again, if you have no community yet, then an empty forum can be worse than having no forum. Um, but um, they can be, they can provide solutions in case um, you have to, to help developers solve things amongst themselves. Well, in this stage, at this stage, the references, FAQ pages, support options in one place, the support overview page, community pages, and discussion forum can be a great help. Step five is about celebrating. You have got, done the integration and you would like to share your work or um, you and as a user and as a developer portal, you would want to enable that. So how can you do that? It's all about engaging users at this stage, so you can ask them to, to rate uh, your documentation. Um, next to, apart from smileys, there's a thumb up, thumb down uh, option. You can ask them to, um, to uh, report bugs to make your documentation better, for example. 
um, you can engage users, for example, by asking them to write guest blog posts. You can even do an interview with them if possible. And you can also ask them to write documentation again to cover those niche problems. You, at the same time, you show your appreciation as well. You can also interact with your community. For example, you can have hackathons. You can also have a place where you indicate events so that your community can meet and you meet with your community. So in th at this stage, developer documentation, or so developers that write documentation blog, um, which I have mentioned before because, um, because of the guest blog posts, for example, asking for feedback and organizing events can help to reduce the friction. The maintaining stage is about the long-term the, the long planning um, because yeah, it should keep on working, everything should keep on working, and uh, your users might want to stay up to date. So change, uh, change logs, release notes are important here. Um, also, you can provide the possibility that your users can subscribe to, uh, to get updates. Reveal future plan plans. Show what you're planning to reduce friction. Um, if you do that, then your users might get less frustrated why something doesn't work yet and why it's not available yet. You can also have uh, little flags next to the APIs um, to indicate what version the API is in, for example. That also reduces friction. So at this stage, release notes, status pages, versioning info, Again, the legal documentation is also important to know whether something is changing over the way and how, how, it will, um, how you can uh, plan for the long term. And future plans are all important. So, the takeaways. It's all about inspiring your developers and uh, reducing friction. And you can reduce friction via documentation. Um, Addressing the usage stages via specific documentation types that fits that person well at that moment that that person needs it, exactly when they need it. And also via DX features. DX is developer experience is a crucial element in achieving business goals. And um, API value will go up, API usage will go up, there will be less friction and you will have engaged users that might even advocate for your product. Here's some best practices listed. Um, the, th the best practices that we covered during this talk. And then remains me to say thank you for listening. Uh, we have a newsletter. The link is on the left, uh, where we regularly publish own and curated content about developer portal strategies, documentation, DX, UX, information architecture, everything related to developer portals. And if you would like to read our previous articles, then on the right you can find the link. Thank you very much.